his name is Job. So turn with me to the book of Job, if you would, chapter 23. Now, there are a lot of others, but the reason I began that way is because we would think of that. And uh, this is not a study of the book of Job. If you're not familiar with Job, read the book of Job. And, um, you know, when we think about Jesus healing the brokenhearted, it's important for us to remember, you know, life's not all bad. Like, have you eaten at least two meals so far today? And is there another one coming? Some of us eat after church. Maybe some of us eat before church and after church. I don't know. You know, there's a lot of blessings. We came here in a vehicle, and uh, we're here with one another, and we have a comfortable place to sit. And there's so many blessings. It's not, we, we've got to just watch out for the mindset. Look, we live in a sinful world. It's infected by sin. That's true. There's a lot of evil out there. It's true. There's a lot of bad, that's true. But we have to be careful about thinking that those things are supposed to define our life. They're not. Like if we're saved, they're not. Like we're here, uh, Nancy and I heard we're at the conference of another mission board last spring, and one of the things that the director, he was speaking, he said was that God is on a mission, and he's invited us to have a part in it. Well, that's a way to view it, isn't it? The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. So, you know, we know what we're getting into. We know what we're getting into in that it's a challenge. We live in a challenging world. But that we shouldn't allow that to sort of depress us like, oh, it's bad. It's all bad. It's only bad. The news is bad. You know, the news is bad because it sells. News is business. Like, you've got to get people to watch. And so everything's breaking news. I've been reading a, a, a biography that was given to me as a gift of, so some of you won't recall this, but when President Kennedy was shot, a Secret Service agent immediately jumped off the car following the limousine with the president, ran to the president's limousine, jumped onto the limousine, and sheltered Mrs. Kennedy uh, the governor of Texas, the governor's wife, and President Kennedy from being shot more. Classic picture of him laying across the back of that car. I've been reading his biography because it was given to me um, as, as a gift. Well, the, the, the reason I mention that is because part of his theme is, look, it was what I signed up for. He was on the Secret Service detail for six presidents and at one time assigned to Mrs. Kennedy. He was her, her Secret Service agent. And um, so when you're in law enforcement, you get up every day and you put a gun and a badge and a bulletproof vest and all this other stuff, and it's because we live in an, an evil world. But you and I, we're on a mission. And so we wouldn't be on a mission if there wasn't a problem, right? That Secret Service agent said, look, I lived knowing any moment the st shots could start flying, and they did, right? But he didn't look at what he was doing as a negative thing. He looked at it as, I'm on a mission, and it's a dangerous mission, but I'm part of it. I get to be part of it. You and I get to be part of this mission. So we meet people all the time. And, you know, most often, not most, probably, but often, we don't have the time to preach a full-length feature sermon to every person. It doesn't happen may eventually, but it certainly isn't going to initially. And we have to remember that old children's gospel song, A Sermon in Shoes? Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Any of you ever hear that? Nancy, Jean, Timo Boots, you know that? Look, there's a few. Ezekiel, yeah. Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? So rather than be overwhelmed with the evil of the world, we need to ask God to help us be the best sermon in shoes that we can. And that includes allowing God to heal our broken heart. So there are at least four things God does to heal broken hearts. There probably are many more. I don't know them all. These are a few to just help us, help me, help you think about it. And the last one I want to share with you is in Job 23. If our kids were here, you know that we have five. They're all adults. And... Um, Today's Crystal's birthday, actually. In China, in China, you plan a birthday party, you pay for everything, you do all the decorating, and you invite the people. You host your own birthday party. So she did that. It would have been last night for us or this morning. But anyway, 
So uh, if they were here and I said, so this is going to be a short sermon, they'd all look at each other and say, oh, great. Great. Why did he say that? It's like, don't, don't be offended. It's like the curse. Because they'd say, oh, no. There's a very simple truth here. I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Then Job answered and said, even today is my complaint bitter. Now, I'm not going to comment all the way through this. I'm not really inclined to that. Don't care for it, actually. But he could have said, even today I have a, I have a broken heart. 23, sorry. Job 23. Even today is my complaint bitter. My stroke is heavier than my groaning. The word stroke there means hand. He's talking about the, there's a heavy hand on me. That's how he feels. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Who, who's he looking for? God. I would even order my cause before him. And fill my mouth with my arguments. I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say unto me. He's saying if I could find God, I'd plead my case and I would listen very, very carefully to his answer. He's saying I need to know the answers. Verse 6, will he plead against me with his great power? No, but he would put strength in me. That is, if I could find him. He's saying, but I can't find him. There the righteous might dispute with him. So should I be delivered forever from my judge. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. You get the sense of it? I'm looking for him. I would listen if he would tell me. He's looking for answers. He wants to know. I'm adding this, but you you follow the spirit of what I mean by that. He wants to know, why do I have this broken heart? And then verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. He's not absent without leave, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word. Bless this simple truth to our hearts, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, four ways God heals broken hearts. One, if it's portion, or if it's all or partly of our own making, we need to own our responsibility. It's always much, uh, for most of us, we're more inclined to look for the people to blame. I, uh, Nancy and I knew a missionary years ago, and in the place where they went, the people they ministered to, on unwritten language, they had to translate the, language in, translate the word in the Word of God into their language, they did not have a verb tense for you doing something wrong. There was no way to say in their culture, I did it. There was no way to say that. So, there were also no windows. But if they broke the window, there was no way to say, I broke the window. The way they would say it is, the window broke itself. So nothing was their responsibility. Everything is not our fault, but if there's a portion that we bear responsibility, we need to own it. Number two, if our broken heart is essentially no fault of our own, the Bible commands us to forgive. As I said this morning, forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. Forgiving doesn't mean you're willing to be kicked, lay down and be kicked again. It doesn't mean that. It means we're giving back to God the right to make the other person pay for what they did to us. We're giving them over to God. Number three, this morning, sometimes the result of having our our broken heart, they're going to be with us for life. They're not going away. Uh, We're going to leave them goodbye when we go to heaven and not until some of them. And in light of that, we looked at that well-known verse, Romans 8, 28, that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. God, as I said, this tried to share this morning, God works them together to cause those things to be beneficial, to be useful. And he does do that, doesn't he? I think probably most, if not all of us, could testify to God taking bad things, working together, make them useful. Okay, here's
here's the fourth one, the last one. It said, I, I, I want, I'm going to read it to you. Sometimes the causes and effects of our brokenheartedness come under the scrutiny of those who don't have the whole story, but they think they have all the answers. So just think about that. Something comes into our life, we end up with a broken heart, and like Job, there's often an audience. Other people are watching, and they think they've got the answer. And if we've read the whole book of Job, that's a part of the theme. We call them his friends. What did he call them? Miserable comforters. <laughs> you know, sometimes in life and ministry, we're just wrong. We're just wrong. Now, I don't, we're not going to have you raise your hand, but can you think of a time when you were just wrong? You were wrong. We find ourselves sometimes we're just wrong. When Nancy and I went away to a little Bible institute in New Brunswick, Canada, I was 19, she was 18. We had gotten married 30 days before that. So we spent our honeymoon in New Brunswick Bible Institute. Well, not really. And um, there was a teacher there, an instructor. His name is Al Cabral. Al's, Al's still alive. And uh, so if I'm 60, Nancy Al must be 75 or 80. Lives in New Brunswick, Canada still. And one day, Al said to me, you know, Chris, you think everything's black and white, don't you? And I put my head back and I stuck my chest out and said, well, it is. I said, everything is black and white. And I don't remember his exact words, but this is what he meant. He, he communicated to me, you know, I hope I'm around. I hope I'm somewhere in sight. I'm hoping I can see you, be watching you, talking to you, hearing you. When the light comes on in your mind and you realize everything is not black and white. We called him Big Al, actually. Even though he was an instructor there, he was the newest one, he was the rookie. And I said, Big Al, that won't be happening. You don't have to worry about being there when it happens. Well, Al's in New Brunswick, I presume. I'm in Claremont, Florida, legally. And um, everything's not black and white. I should write Al a note. Dear Al, you missed it. Everything's not black and white. Now, there's another extreme of that that this sermon is not about, and it's this. Everything's not gray air either. You know, everything's not gray. Today it's come see, come saw, whatever it will be, will be. You know, you've got your truth, I've got my truth, but that's not really what this sermon is, a, is about. Um, you know, it's good to be able to say, you know, I'm wrong. It's good to be able to say, I was wrong. I was wrong. I, I don't know. I, I, maybe it's age, immaturity, upbringing, whatever it is. Like my peanut brain thought like saying you're wrong is a sign of weakness. But when you're wrong, you're wrong. You're just wrong. And when you're wrong, it's good to be able to say, you know, I, I, was, I was wrong. So don't let it shake you. When the light comes on, <clears throat> you're wrong. It's a part of life. And for some of us, it's like this life-altering shock to realize we were wrong. We were wrong. I heard, I read this quote. It's unknown who said this quote always keep your words soft and sweet just in case you have to eat them when i started pastoring sermons were recorded on cassette tape probably most of those tapes of me are long gone i hope so i hope so 
Nancy and I were at the Ambassador Baptist College last year, last spring, and the man in chapel said this, quote, you don't have to undo damage caused by statements that are not made. Let me read that again. Quote, you don't have to undo damage caused by statements that are not made. You ne- Can I say it this way? Now look, Ezekiel Booth is going to sound a little rude. It's not meant to sound rude. Pavel Booth, Lazarus Booth's not sure where he is, so we'll just leave him alone. You know, sometimes the best thing is to keep your mouth closed. Sometimes I'm not too good at that. I'm better, but not good. Sometimes you're just wrong. Okay, what's the next thing I'm going to say? Sometimes you're right. Sometimes you're right. You're just right. That's the way it is. You're right. But the problem is, sometimes when we're right, there's only two, I'm going to say two people, but There's only two entities who know you're right. You and who? God. And um, if we're right, by the way, we're probably right by the grace of God. I say this carefully to those of you who study the Bible and know the Bible and that. I actually believe today, I think, probably 99% of the theological things I've always believed. I can't think of a thing that I've changed my theological view on. I can't think of anything. There could be something. I don't think so. It could be stubbornness, but I I haven't. I remember Nancy and I on uh, September 24th or so, we'll be in Pembroke, Maine. I'll preach at my mentor's church. So if I'm 63, 75 or whatever, And uh, one day we got into a discussion because there's five pastors there and we were writing a doctrinal statement for a camp ministry and they agreed on the wording that Jesus died physically and spiritually on the cross. And I said, well, that's not true. I said, that's not true. And these three pastors, these these are good and godly men. Like these are theologians. Chris just a talker, you know. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus didn't die spiritually on the cross. That, I was probably 20 years old. I said, that didn't happen. That's wrong. And um, I still do not believe Jesus died spiritually on the cross. And my mentor, Gary, will, like I said, we'll be there in September, and we'll sit down at his table, and maybe I'll say to him, hey, Gary, about that business of Jesus dying spiritually on the cross, he'll pull his Bible out and say, well, just hold on just a second. You know? So when I say I haven't changed what I believe, it's because God hasn't shown me I was wrong about something. What the Bible teaches. Follow what I'm saying? Like the Bible's the Word of God. Jesus is the Son of God. What the Holy Spirit of God. I still believe the same eschatology that I always believe. Now, bear with me, because you think what you're trying to say is you're a 19-year-old genius. That's not what I'm trying to say. But, by the grace of God, I'm learning to see people differently who don't see it the way I see it. They're not all heretics. They're not all liberal. They're not all ungodly. They're not all part of the conspiracy to attack the truth of the Word of God. I was talking with some guys one time, and we were talking about eschatology and the rapture, Pastor Paul. One guy said, well, I believe in pre-trib. I believe in post-trib. I believe in mid-trib. Now we've got the pre-wrath. I believe in pre-wrath. And this other guy said, well, I believe in the spare tire theory. I said, the spare tire theory, I never heard of that. He said, well, this is what I believe. It's all going to work out in the end. It's all going to work out in the end. I'm not saying we should be soft on doctrine, but this is a battlefield, not a recreation room. And sometimes, probably often, there's not much gained by wanting the satisfaction to say, and by the way, I was right. I was right. I was right. So notice what Job said. 
he said in verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. Just two words. He knoweth. He knoweth. Because sometimes when it comes to having a broken heart, our heart's broken. And our cause and effects come under other people's scrutiny. They know. They think they know. They've deduced. They've understood it. They think they've understood it. And I'm not saying we're right all the time. I'm not saying we're right most of the time. I'm saying, but sometimes when we're right, what assists our broken heart is that he knows. By the way, he knows and they're not asking. Do you know when adults want your advice? When they ask for it. Most adults don't want your advice if they haven't asked for it. All right? So what they know, what they think they know, what they say to others, what they say to us, which may or not be correct, can feel like a continual swing at a broken heart. You know, I'm one of those. I'm just wired this way. If you just give me the chance to explain, you would realize I'm right. Now, I want to say that carefully because I, I don't no, I don't mean that. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say I'm one of those guys that thinks, look, if you just let me explain it, you won't kick me to the curb quite so quick. Not that I'm right, but you'll if I could just explain it to you, you'd say, oh, I get it now. <sighs> I tried that a few times. Got absolutely nowhere. But I think, oh, let me explain it again. You follow me? Let me say it again. Let me tell you about this again. Um. I think they're going to say, oh, I, oh I, I, I see, I get it. And then they're going to say, and I'm sorry. And I don't want to make us sound like martyrs, but there are those times. We're right. Maybe it's only a few. Maybe it's the minority, but we're right on this. But the only two that know we're right are us and God. If you read through what Job said here, the two most powerful words in, these, in these, those ten verses, in my view, are this. He knoweth. He knoweth. And sometimes we have to say, God, you're going to have to help me because I don't think I'm going to get the chance to explain myself. And if I explain myself, I don't think they're going to be listening. I think if I try to explain myself and you're not leading the way, I am going to make matters worse. I'm going to give them more ammunition to point out just how wrong I, I am. I know, he knows, and I'm not saying I'm right most of the time. I'm talking about those times when something has broken our heart, we do know the facts. I sat right in the room, right back here, with uh, two men. Boy, they, they really let me have it. It goes with the territory. They let me have it. And so pretty soon one of them stopped talking. I said, look, can I just say something to you? You don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry, you don't know what you're talking about. How do you know? I said, I was there. I know what I said, because I was there. You know what I accomplished? Zero. Didn't accomplish anything. I couldn't just slide back in my seat and say, you know, I love both you guys. I love you today. I loved you yesterday. I'm going to love you tomorrow. And say in myself, without my lips moving, God knows. God knows. That's what matters. God knows. And he may choose to vindicate us. He might. Like I have no Bible verse for this. We shouldn't live waiting for the vindication. You know, we think, well, I'm going to get to heaven. God's going to get it all right. And I'm going to walk up to them and say, I told you Jesus didn't die spiritually on the cross. You guys wouldn't listen to me. These were all my mentors. That's kind of how we view it. But actually, do you think heaven is about pointing out who's right and who's wrong? I have a feeling that has nothing to do with heaven. And um, sometimes I may not know all I think I know. Like I say, I know. Sometimes I don't know all I think I know. And so God is patiently waiting for me to realize I don't know all that I think that I know. 
You know how many times sometimes I say, and one more thing. <laughs> well, it's like when you're disciplining your kids. One more time, one more time, one more time, one more time. We think, well, just one more thing, just one more thing. Sometimes we just need to stay back and say, he knows the way that I take. He knows. He knows. And he knows where I'm right. He knows where I'm wrong. He knows what he wants to accomplish. I think I know what he wants to accomplish, and I could be way off base here. Job said, I can't find him. If I could find him, I'd tell him. I'd listen to everything he says, but I can't find him. But he knows where I am. He knows where I am. I have a bit of an unusual, Pastor Paul, view of something. I have never felt it my role to go looking for a ministry in the past. I've just never felt that way. And I've talked to good and godly men. If they sense the move coming to another church, they start putting their resume out to their friends and contact them. It's a very common way to do it. I have no criticism of them. I have no objection about those who do it. It's just something the Lord never impressed upon me to do, go looking for a different place to serve. Because, Brother Paul, I'd have been looking about every other Monday. Because I'm just a frail person. But this is what I'd say to people. They'd say, well, how will you ever know if God wants to move you from one place to another? I said, I've got news for you. He's got my zip code. He's got my phone number. You know what I tell him today? He's got my email address. If he wants to get a hold of me, he won't have any trouble getting a hold of me as long as I'm listening. Sometimes we just have to stop and say, you know what? He knows. Sometimes, hey, Leslie girls, sometimes with your mom and dad, you just have to say, well, God knows. I tried to tell them. They don't listen. Sometimes with your husband or wife, look, we've talked about this enough. We need to say, look, God knows. He knows. I, it's, it's not doing anything to keep talking about this. He knows. And he really does know. And probably the scorecard of me being right is, and I'm not being humble, it's probably a lot slimmer than I think. But the consolation is, God knows the way that I take it. And he, that's what matters, that he knows. And I don't have to cause a ruckus and tell a story and add my two cents and a little here to try to convince other people because then, all it feels is like that, that resurfacing the argument feels like another swing at my broken heart. Whereas if I say, well, God knows, that's the way it is. He knows. And he really does. Amen? He really does. You know, Judah, how old are you? Twelve. You know what that means is next, don't you? Seventeen. No, thirteen. So Judah's going to be a teenager soon. You know, sometimes, Judah, when you're a teenager, and you explain, try to explain something to your mom and dad. Your mom and dad are good people who have your best interest in heart. But sometimes you try to explain something to your mom and dad, and you think, let me try this again. They're not getting it. There are other times we just have to say, God knows. God knows. And he's going to work. And he does, doesn't he? Doesn't really take away that broken heart, but it gives us satisfaction to know who's over the, over the, over the, over the. Job said he knows the way that I take. So let's pray. Father, it's true. You know, Lord, we're, we're not always, we're not usually right, but there are times we're right. We know we're right. There's no disputing it, at least as best we understand the facts. We're right. But the majority think we're wrong. And they're talking, and they're telling, and they're concluding, and they're analyzing, and they're scheming, and they're cutting off, and they're rejecting. And it really hurts. We just want one chance to explain it to them. But Lord, they're not, apparently, they're not ready to listen, or you'd give them our email address too. So help us to rest in the fact that you know the way that we take. You know. You know. Help us rest in that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.